everybody feeling today? You feeling okay? You feeling alive and awake today? Man, I do. I'm very excited. You may be wondering, there's only one person on stage right now. I thought there were be four. Well, don't you worry. They're coming up in just a moment. But I'm going to just welcome us into the service today. So those who are joining us online or even those who are on campus, those who are in, our, in cars today, can I get a honk honk if you're in there? Woo! Awesome. Perfect. Yes. Thank you for the backup. We're so glad to have all of you joining us today. I am so excited that we're going to get to share a message with you today. Um, but before we kick off anything, um, I want to give honor where honor is due. Can we lift up Pastor Jared and Pastor DeVette? Because they are the reason that we're here today. Um, they aren't here. Uh, I'm I'm, they might be watching. Maybe my mom's watching, but I know Pastor Jared is speaking elsewhere today. But um, we are so thankful for the impact that they have made on our lives. Um, granted, they're my parents, so they have a little more say in my life, but I know they have made an impact in yours. And we wouldn't be here where we are today without them and their investment into this church and into this community. So we're so thankful for them. Um, I'm excited about today because we are continuing on in a series called Insta family, snapshots of a healthy family. How many of you know when you take a picture, you post on Instagram, right? You don't usually use the first picture you take. You use the best one, right? You don't use the one that has a little, uh, a little bit of a double chin. You use the one that makes you look really nice and healthy, gives you that good glow. You choose a good picture. Um, but oftentimes in real life and in reality, we don't just do that on Instagram. We do that in real life in relationships with people. We kind of present ourselves as having it all together. Um, but what I love about scripture is that we go time and time again and we see regular families with real problems, uh, with real issues, and it doesn't edit it. It's just the real and raw and edited version. And we can glean from them. We can learn what to do and what not to do. Um, and so I'm excited today to share with you some of the things that our family we're, like I said, we're not perfect in any way, um, but we have seen God do some cool things in our family. And so we're going to share with you some of the real and raw stuff. We're going to share with you maybe some wisdom that we feel like could gleam, uh, you guys could take and gleam from your family. So um, I want us to do one thing before we get started. I want us to read our theme scripture today, and that is Psalm 127.1. And everybody stand to your feet with me. We're going to read God's word together today says this, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Why don't you close your eyes with me? Lord, we thank you for who you are today. We ask that you would be magnified. God, would it not be about us being children? Would it be about you? God, would you speak to us, open our hearts, get us prepared for what you have for us? And we ask that you would move. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. All right, you can take a seat. You guys ready for our performance? Or yeah, we're going to perform for you. You didn't even know. <laughs> okay, well, um, as I said earlier, I don't know if I did actually. I'm Haley. Um, and I get to serve here as our next gen, next gen pastor. So I work with junior high all the way to our college program. And I'm Macy, the oldest and the wisest. And I work in the worship department. My name's Tanner. I may not be the wisest, but I'm definitely the favorite. 
um, out of all the children. Uh, I work with the young adults in a high school ministry here. My name is Leilani. I'm married into the family, and I get to serve as our leadership college director as well as our special needs pastor. And the one of us who's not here is our youngest brother, Hudson. He was the cute one at the end who's like, we're family. He's, um, he's actually 20 years old now, which is crazy because I used to tutor him when he was in high school, and that was kind of my foot in the door with these guys, but we miss him. Tutored me as well. I probably needed it, so. So let's get started with maybe some icebreakers so you guys can kind of get to know us just a little bit. I'm wondering, for all of you guys, what were some of your favorite memories growing up as a kid? I loved, um, there was this one season where one of my uncles on my mom's side of the family, he got this go-kart. And so we went to my great-grandma's uh, house, and she had a bunch of land, and so we made a racetrack out of there. The whole gang would go over there. At one point, um, Pastor Tanner and I, we did get into a little bit of a fumble, um, <laughs> but we survived. We made it out alive, And um, but although that happened, there are a lot of good memories. Um, we had a lot of fun. I think mine were when we were camping. So like when I was like in seventh grade and they were little, the three of us and my Papa Dave would go camping once a year. And it was just so much fun because we were like away from our parents. We kind of got to like stay up late and hang out. And and then also we used to perform at our talent shows together, you know, M4, our family band. And um, there was this one time we actually were just watching home videos the other day and Leilani was doing karate as well. And she was like, I don't know, seven so cute. Yeah. yeah. That's the moment I knew, you know, we were going to get married. Um, gosh, favorite memories. I don't have many. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, guys. Sorry. Um, I know. But one of my favorite memories, honestly, just in general, was the chaos in the car drives. So you guys ever have that with your siblings? It just got chaotic. I loved that. Like, I just thought it was hilarious. I know it's weird. But I remember this one time, I call it the pineapple story. There was this pineapple that was given to my brother from my grandma. We had a 30-minute drive. That's we only needed to make it 30 minutes, people. That's it. But my brother takes the pineapple. Well, Macy wants the pineapple to, to wait to be opened until we get to, and shaved down until we get to my grandma's house. So they start arguing, my brother and Macy. And then I start laughing at them because it's getting ridiculous. And so then Macy turns to me and starts yelling at me. And then my parents start yelling at us. And Haley's trying to negotiate between everyone. It gets to a point where Hudson is holding a pineapple out of the window on the freeway, and I'm looking at him in the face saying, do it, drop it, <laughs> do it. He didn't do it, but I wish he did. Nice. When I was a kid, not now, not now. So that, that brings up an interesting point I think we all experience. No matter how old you are, you probably still have conflict with your siblings, maybe a little bit. Um, but how do you guys resolve conflict between each other? Well, when we were little, it was different. My mom would make us sit down in front of each other and say, I'm sorry, you're my best friend and I love you. And then that was that. Um, but now that we're older, I think we just learn that we all communicate different. And um, I think the most important thing at the end of the day is that we talk it out because our relationship is the most important thing. And I think it's easy as siblings to argue because we see each other's flaws. We get annoyed with each other probably more than anyone. Um, but I also think it's easy for siblings to compare a lot. And it's easy for us to be like, oh, Tanner's the golden child, so-and-so is the black sheep. And um, instead of really supporting each other and really championing each other. And um, Haley, I wanted to ask you, how do you feel like is the best way to champion your siblings and support them instead of comparing? Yeah, I think um, the best answer can be found when you look at the story of Joseph and his brothers, you know, when they threw him in a pit because they were so <laughs> jealous. That's what you should do, right? Just throw him in a pit when you're mad at them. I think that's the best plan. Um, I'm totally kidding. Don't do that. And if you are thinking about it, then maybe you should tell somebody. Um, but um, being completely honest, this is something that I've really struggled with growing up. Um, and even to this day, it's something I struggle with. Comparison is like, my uh, Achilles. <laughs> it's the, the one thing that can really get me. Um, and so maybe some of you are like me, and this can be a struggle. It cannot even just be with your family. It can be with friendships. It can be in a work environment. Right. Um, this is real transferable to any sort of field. Um, and so I'm just going to give you some things that help me in my moments of weakness, um, and hopefully they can help you. Um, so the, the first kind of idea I think is really important when we're stuck in comparison um, and we're wanting to champion our siblings is to remember that we work better together. 
Amen. We work better together. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians, and it says this. Um, follow along with me. We don't have it up on the screen, but it says, But our bodies, they have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. Amen. God put you right where he wants you. Um, and then it says, The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. We work better together. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important for us to realize that God placed each and every one of us in our families intentionally. Right. Even if you are adopted or maybe someone in your family is adopted, God placed and positioned them in your life for a reason. For me, our youngest brother, Hudson, he's adopted. Um, and when I think about what our lives would have looked like without him, I'm sure things may have been easier uh, in some ways, just like if Macy were gone or if one of the others were missing, things would be definitely easier. But I am so grateful that Hudson is a part of my family that God knew that we needed right. him. Yeah. And I think it's just really important for us to remember God knew that you guys, that you're, you, you're, you and your siblings, that you guys would need each other for the rest of your life. Um, and he was so intentional with it. And what's cool for us is we, we get to work together. So we get to spend time together every day. Um, we really get to see each other's weaknesses on display um, and our strengths, though. Because in reality, I'm like, I'm really good. I bring structure. But Tanner's the hype guy, and he's really funny. And so he, we get to run a ministry together, and we get to see that play out. Um, and so I don't know what your guys' relationships look like with your siblings, but I do want to encourage you that God placed you in their life for a reason. Right. And um, them and yours. And I think sometimes we can focus so much on the negatives that it can really uh, it can turn our hearts hard towards the people that are in our life. Yeah. And I want to make sure that we're protecting each other and protecting ourselves. Um, and so remember, we work better together. And then the second idea is that we walk through it together. Um, later on in that passage, it says, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. We carry each other through every season. We walk through life together. That means we walk through the hard situations. We walk through the tough moments. Um, and I think sometimes we can get really caught up and be, maybe we're frustrated because this person hurt us. Maybe we're frustrated because they didn't handle this well. And you know what? They probably didn't. Um, but at the end of, at the end of everything, we have to remember that we walk through life together. So maybe you're in an estranged relationship, um, and I just want to encourage you, whether it's, you know, maybe you can't be in their life in this moment right now, um, but continue to pray for them because the best thing that we can do is walk through it with them in prayer. Um, and so I just, I feel like that's really important. And then celebrate with one another, you know? Yeah. We can celebrate the high moments. Instead of being like wishing you got that promotion, say, hey, like I am so proud of you. Like you did a great okay. job. You know, let's celebrate with one another. We walk right. all of life with each other. We walk through it together. And then the last idea, um, so we work better together. We walk through it together. And then the last idea is that we honor one another. We honor our siblings, and not only our siblings, but we honor our parents. And I see some junior hires looking at me, rolling your eyes, saying, ah, I don't know if I can honor my parents. They're the worst. They made me clean my room today. What are you talking about? Uh, but we honor our parents, and that changes in different seasons. Um, so that brings me to kind of my next question. So Tanner and Lay, uh, how did you guys honor your parents as kids, and how does it look differently now as adults? Honor is one of my favorite topics, actually. It was a value that was held in really high esteem in my house growing up. Um, all the men in my family, my dad, my grandparents, and now my brother were in law enforcement or the armed forces. So they ran a really tight ship. And then throw my mom in the mix, who lives out the Bible better than anyone else I know in my life. And she'll bring it home with the, the value of biblical honor, what the Bible says about how we should honor. And so when you read in Exodus 20 about the Ten Commandments, one of them says to honor your father and mother. And there's no stipulation attached. It's not right. honor your father and mother if they treat you well yeah. or Good. if they pay for your college tuition or if they're even present at all in your life, the, the commandment is simply honor your father and mother. And then on top of it, it's the only commandment with a promise. 
And so when the Bible gives me a promise, I want to look closer and say, well, how do I achieve that? It says, honor your father and mother and you will have long life. And so I think there's something divine, there's something holy about the principle of honor and how we can outwork that as children of God. And honor is not the same as obedience, right? I can do what my parents ask of me, but if I don't do it with the right heart or the right attitude, that's not honor, right? right? So I have to make sure that honor is about the positioning of my heart more than it is about the worthiness of the person receiving right. honor. Okay. Whether it's your parents, whether it's your boss, the president, we have to make sure that we are positioned to honor through all seasons. And yeah, it does take different forms as you grow up and become an adult or move out of your parents' house. But um, there's a cool story about this in uh, the Bible that talks about Noah and his sons. Tanner, do you want to share about that with us? You know what? I would be honored to share that with you. Um, <laughs> Great answer, by the way. Um, no, I love this story. It's the story of Noah. Um, right after he gets off the ark, he finds himself in his tent. His son walks in, and uh, he's laying there drunk, and he's naked. And uh, I know it's kind of a weird scene, but his son walks in, and as he's looking there at his father um, in a vulnerable position in a weak place, um, instead of going to tend to him and maybe cover him with a blanket or care for him, what he does actually is he runs out of the tent and he runs to his siblings and he makes fun of his dad. I mean, I've made fun of my dad before. I mean, but not to this extent. I mean, this guy is going over, over the line. And what his brothers do in this story actually is they walk inside the tent when they hear that their brother comes to them and he's acting childish. Have your siblings ever acted childish before? <laughs> Both of them. Okay, I see. Um, and they go in and they walk with their heads turned away from their father so that they see not his nakedness. And then they cover him with a blanket. And I look at this story and I, I love it, the principle of honor in it, because um, there's really two ways that you can respond to a, a moment of difficulty, to a moment of, 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 of just issues in your family. You can either cover your family or you can uncover them. Right, what happens with him is he runs out and he uncovers all the stuff that his dad, you gotta check out my dad, he's, he's naked, he's whatever, he's drunk and he's supposed to be a man of God. I thought he was a man who's close to God but here he is, he's messing up. Or you can be like the other sons and you can cover them. I wanna ask you the question, in your own life, in your family, when situations come up, right? When things arise, when maybe your family is rude to you or maybe there's a situation are you supporting them? Are you encouraging them? Are you speaking life over them, protecting their reputation? Right. Or are you getting so excited to go to your next hair salon appointment where you can spill all your beans or right. get, get with your family and go in that little corner where you can share all about everything that's happened in your family? We need to be people that protect and honor our parents, our yeah. siblings, our family. Right. And not only that, the people around us. Yeah. The Bible says in Proverbs 18.21, it says this. We have the power to speak life and death with our words. Right. Yeah. So how are you speaking about your family? How are, you, how are you talking about them in front of your children? Because if you're not careful, what's going to happen is all your life you're going to be complaining about the grandparents and your parents. And when they move out one day, they're going to think it's okay to do the same to you. So let's be people who are encouraging our family, are speaking well, because what we don't want is we don't want that little bit of hurt, that little bit of anger towards them to become bitterness mm -hmm. right. and resentment, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I think that's happened to all of us. And when you get there, it's just, you're in a hole, man. It's hard to dig out, just like Joseph when you just get in that hole. So um, I want to change direction real quick, and I want to ask my siblings a question as we're talking about resentment. How have you guys served in the church and served Jesus without having resentment towards the church? How have you been a part of this, you know, and not just hated it, honestly, as, as pastor's kids and as, as part of ministry? I think this is a really good question because I see a lot of people who are raised in the church go away from their faith. Um, and I think a few reasons, actually I was thinking of a new one today, um, of why people start to build up resentment in their hearts as when they transition like as kids growing up in the church. 
I think one is that they see their parents go to church on Sundays and live for Jesus on Sundays, but then who they are and the rest of the week doesn't line up with that. And so I think for me, seeing my, you know, my parents, my grandparents, not that they were perfect, because I want to make it clear, like my family is absolutely not perfect. We've said it like a million times, but we have a lot of challenges. And there are a lot of moments where I've been disappointed, where I've been hurt by my parents, by my family. And I think that's normal. But I knew that at the end of the day, that they loved Jesus with all their heart and their lives were for Jesus. Their Christianity showed in their lives. And so I think that's protected me from that and seeing, I want to live a life for Jesus, not just follow a religion. I want a relationship with Jesus. And then I think another thing too is growing up in church, just being real, you know, like our dad is a pastor. So, you know, he was planning this church. So he was here a lot. And so I think for kids, if they can see, um, out of balance, maybe of like a parent, um, serving and, um, too much and not getting enough family time in, um, I think that can also cause resentment too. So making sure that that family is still a priority, even though you're serving the church, you're in community, that's so important, but that your kids know that you love them and that they're important to you, that they're, they're your first ministry. Mm. So. That's so good. Um, for me too, and I just, I want to say, um, I hope you guys know, she said it just a moment ago, we're not perfect. We've had our moments where we haven't wanted to do this. We've had our moments where, honestly, me, I'll just speak for me. I haven't always wanted to serve Jesus. I haven't always wanted to live my life for him because it takes sacrifice. And that sacrifice, I don't always like. I don't like giving him control over things. I don't, I don't like that all the time. Right. And so it, it, can be, it can be discouraging in moments. Um, and, and, I mean, I've wanted to walk away from Jesus, but I know that ultimately— Jesus is better than anything else that I could ever have. And so I think for me, what has kept me serving Jesus, kept me walking with him, um, is knowing why I do it. Even from a young age, um, I, was, I was always serving in some capacity, whether it was I was leading the kids in, um, in worship, you know, all the hand movements and stuff. And then when I was in junior high, I started playing bass on the worship team. Um, and then, you know, the rest is history. Um, but I think what was really great for me was being plugged in um, and serving uh, because it became not just about me, but my walk became about so much more. Because as Christ followers, our job isn't just to love Jesus. Our job is to show him to other people. Mm -hmm. And so when I was serving, it showed me that my, my role as a Christian is to help other people walk and know Jesus just like I do. Um, and so when I was serving, it reminded me of the why. And it's what I tell my team all the time. I always encourage them, hey, let's remember why we do this. We do, I'm the, so I work with junior high and high school, so I always tell my team, we are here for the, for the kids. We're here because God's called us to work with them. Um, and so it keeps me rooted in ministry now, and it kept me rooted when I was a kid. Um, what about you, Leigh? That's so good. Um, I think the first thing to note is that no human is perfect, right? So therefore, no organization and no church is perfect. And disappointment is just misplaced expectation. So if you're expecting your pastor to be perfect or if you're expecting your church to be perfect, unfortunately, you'll be disappointed. So from the onset, let's just reset that expectation, right? And then secondly, when, not if, but when you get disappointed in an environment like this, you have to uproot bitterness right away. Pastor Jared preached on it a few weeks ago, but we can't take the bait of offense, which is so common in today's culture. We just can't do it. We have to submit to spiritual authority. We have to make sure that we're finding accountability, right? And all these things I'm discussing are found in community. And the church is community. Community is vital. Community actually, um, sound theology, okay? So that just means your belief about God. Sound theology is built on three things in tandem, and that's scripture, spirit, and community. Good. You can't have one or two without the third. And unfortunately, so many people get hurt in church, and they don't uproot that bitterness. They let it grow into resentment. They leave the church, and then they form this false idea that church was an optional extra. Right. 
and that you are able to build um, a sound faith and belief about God on your own. And that's just not true. Church is God's redemption plan for our broken world. It's why we're here. The purpose of the church is to display ideal, redeemed community to our hurting world. So when people who don't know God come into this place, they should feel a sense of welcome home. This is what you've been searching for. Right? Right? So that's our job. Our job is to display that to the world. And you know what? God is so passionate about community that he himself is not one, he's three. So we have to make sure that we're intentional. We have the mindset that community is vital and that I'm going to fight for it. And I'm not going to take the first offense. And I'm not going to fall into bitterness and resentment. And I'm going to be intentional about keeping plugged in to community. So with that, it's, it's a mindset. It's intentional. And Macy, I think you're really good at knowing what mindsets are healthy or maybe unhealthy for a family to operate. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, I think... Well, I'm the kind of person that thinks of a million <laughs> reasons or a million things. I, I also am very indecisive. So if you ask me a question of like, what would be my favorite song to play on an island or something, I wouldn't be able to tell you. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I love to ask the questions, but I can't answer them. Um, but I think two things come to mind. And the first thing I think is we need to be committed to relationship. And not just like the kind of commitment where like I am committed to go to the gym this year starting January 1st, but a kind of commitment that lasts throughout all kinds of weather, throughout all kinds of struggles and difficulties, that we're committed to relationship and also that our our lives show that we're committed to relationship. So kind of what I was saying earlier with with kids growing up in ministry, that your kids know that family is a priority to you. And I think for us, something that I'm very thankful for is that my mom used to always make us go to Fresno like once a month because her family was there. And we struggled when we were kids like, I don't want to go. I want to hang out with my friends. But now that is a priority to us because my mom modeled that for us. And so I think just being committed to relationship. And Proverbs 17, 17 says, friends love through all kinds of weather and families stick together in all kinds of trouble. So make a commitment to work things out. Make a commitment to choose relationship over being right. So be committed to relationship. And then I think the second thing is be committed to peace. In uh, Genesis 13, Abraham and Lot were going to the land that God had told them to go to, and their families started fighting. And so Abram basically said, hey, our families are arguing, but we're family, so we need to make sure we're in peace. So we need to split up and go separate ways because our peace is more important. And so I think that just models to us that it's so important to be in peace with our family. And that doesn't mean that we avoid conflict. That doesn't mean that we, um, you know, try and avoid making people upset and all that kind of stuff. Of course, we want to be sensitive. But I think that means being willing to, like Leilani said, fight for peace fight for that relationship. That means having the hard conversations. That means saying, hey, when you did this, it kind of affected me this way. And, and like she said with the church, uprooting that bitterness right away before it can grow and become something yucky. And then suddenly, who is your best friend is now your stranger. You know, I, I don't know about you, but for me, relationship is so much more important than my pride. And relationship is so much more important than me being right. I would much rather be wrong and still have a relationship with my sister than, than not, you know? Like, I, I think it's so, so crucial that we do that. And, and the reality is, is our families hurt us. They're the closest people to us. So they can hurt us more deeply than anybody can. But we have to be willing to say, is this worth the cost of my relationship. And I think some ways to do that is be the first person to ask for forgiveness. Whether you feel like you were in the wrong or not, there's always something you can apologize for. You can say, I'm sorry I made you feel that way. You know, I'm, I'm sorry for my part in that, that I communicated that way or whatever it is. Take ownership because we all can be in the wrong at some point. And then the other thing is be the first person to forgive. Be the first person to let things go. Um, In Proverbs 17, 9 says, Overlook an offense and bond a friendship, but fasten on a slight and goodbye, friend. Which just tells me if I get so focused on the differences, if I get so focused on the things that they did to hurt me, 
then I'm going to lose that relationship. And it's just too valuable. It's too priceless for me to let go. And you may be in a situation today where maybe you're not close to your sibling. Maybe you're not close to your parents. Maybe you have a difficult relationship, but maybe this is a season where God wants to bring healing and restoration. And it might look different. It might not look like you're together all the time, you're talking all the time, but maybe God's going to begin to heal your heart. Maybe you're har- harboring some unforgiveness in your heart, and today God wants you t- to forgive. Amen. It's our job to forgive, whether they've said sorry, whether they've done the right thing, just like honor is, is about us and how we honor them, not about them. Forgiveness is about us, too, and us doing our part, too. So be committed to relationship and be committed to peace. And I think, too, you know, and in, in, we're in a weird season as a family. Not a weird season, just a different season, a life-changing season. Tanner and Leilani just got married. I got a sister, and it's been amazing. But it's different, you know. They're forming their own family, and they're, they're a part of the Ming family, the Jared Ming family. But they're also forming their own family, their own values. Um, and they're determining what their family moral compass looks like, what their legacy legacy looks like. They're taking what, you know, from Leilani's parents, from Tanner's parents, and figuring out what that looks like for them. So you guys, what does it look like to you guys to build a godly legacy? No, that's a great question. Before I address that, I just want to take a moment and say thank you uh, to all of our church family. Um, You guys have always just allowed us, Ming children, to have a, a voice here as well as all the young adults and um, youth in this church. I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Um, you know, we are who we are because of the community we have. And we talk, we, we're talking about community all day. So I just wanted to preface that and say thank you. Um, but as far as legacy, I love talking about legacy. Um, it's something my dad was passionate about, something my grandparents were passionate about. And so when I got married, I'm like, I want us to have, you know, an amazing legacy. I want us to 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 leave something behind for our children and for our grandchildren one day. And, um, and so, but I, I think when it comes to legacy, you know, w- we grew up in Christian homes, right? Our, our parents were all for Jesus. They, they centered our family on Jesus, but it wasn't perfect, and there were a lot of things that could have been changed. And so when we got married, we started thinking, what are some things that we want to see our family do? What are some things that our parents did that we want to incorporate in our family? And so we recognized that legacy was intentional. Right. Legacy takes intention, right? Yeah. You can't just show up on your deathbed one day and your legacy is there. No, I believe legacy is intentional. We have to build disciplines in our life that lead us towards success. So our goal is to create these disciplines, and I want you to share some disciplines that we do um, that lead us. And, and I hope that I would encourage you guys as well as you're talking about legacy. Right. Well, I want to thank you because I think I know I'm not a very disciplined person. Tanner is quite the opposite. Everything he eats, every time he sleeps, down to the bigger things about the God call on his life, he's disciplined about everything. So he's been great at helping me fix my focus and make sure that we as a, as a married couple are disciplined in the things we do. And the first thing that is a priority for us is daily prayer time. So if you want to build a godly legacy... For your family, you have to be in prayer with your spouse and with your family daily. Prayer is so important. We keep it short so that we can keep it consistent, right? We'll pray for our biological family. We'll pray for you guys, our church family, daily. We pray for our future kids. We pray for anything pressing at the moment. But you have to make sure that prayer is a priority. As much as I want to talk to my husband all day, I should want to talk to God all day. Make sure that we're in communion. We're always discussing um, what we're just envisioning God to do in our life. And then another thing we do is we prioritize wise counsel because we know that we're very young and we don't know everything. We don't know anything, actually. So we need people who are wiser and older and further along on the journey who can speak into our life and go, hey, let's, let's not do that. Let's go this way a little bit. So before we were married, we sought out marriage counselors. And we now meet with them monthly to make sure that we're on the right track. Because let's debunk the myth that marriage counseling is for when you're in crisis. It's not. We have marriage counselors so that we can prevent a future crisis in our marriage, hopefully. Amen? <laughs> Wise counsel is so important. Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 says there's victory in a multitude of counsel. 
And so when you can get the right people around you who can speak into your life and see the things that you can't see, you're set up for victory. Right. You're set up for success. And then from that, the Bible says, freely you have received, now freely give. So we want to make sure that we're taking our time to invest into others, the young adults that God's placed around us or, or just the people in our lives. We want to make sure we're investing time, energy, and resource into other people because our legacy is not just about us. The Bible says our lives are but a vapor. We're here one day and gone the next. So what lasts is what we'll invest into other people. And then lastly, when you build anything, whether you're building something physically or you're building something spiritually, you got to build something around it to keep it protected. And so healthy boundaries in your family, those are vital. Just so that someone with not the right intentions can't just come and knock down what you've spent all of your time and energy building. So we set boundaries to protect our rest, to protect our romance, to protect the things that we know are priorities for our lives and our legacy, you have to make sure that there's boundaries around those things so that um, nothing, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah, and having vision too. I think you got to have vision. The Bible says without vision, the people perish. So do you have vision for your family? And does your family know your vision? Right? you got to make the vision plain, the Word says. And so... We, when we first got married, we wrote down some vision statements for our family and for um, our marriage, and we're going to go ahead and read those together, um, and our hope is that it would encourage you and instill some vision inside of you for your family. So yeah. you want to read these together? Sure. The Mings, the Mings love, love and serve God, and it is evident in all we do. The, the Mings, Mings love people and believe the best about others. The, the Mings are leaders. We set an example that, if replicated, would make the world a better place. The Mings, the Mings live for an audience of one. We do not live to please people. The Mings find our identity in Christ alone. People's opinions do not define who we are. The Mings are generous in time, energy, and resource. The Mings work harder than we are asked to, always. The Mings are spirit-led, not emotion-led. We are proactive, not reactive. The Mings are authentic and humble. We lead with vulnerability. The Mings honor those placed in authority over us, whether we agree or not. The Mings love each other unconditionally. We choose to honor, serve, and protect each other fiercely. The Mings count it all joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We celebrate on all occasions. So those are our vision statements. And Oh, thank you. Um, we're not saying you need to write those down and start chanting them in your home or something like that. That's, that's not what we're saying. But what I, I do know is one day my son is going to walk up to me. He's going to be angry with his teacher because his teacher's rude. And then he's going to be like, Dad, I want to switch classes or Dad, I don't want to whatever. I'm like, first of all, shut up. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I'm going to say, you know, son, you know what the Mings believe about that. The Mings, we honor those placed in authority over us. Right. We know that God has placed them there. That's one of our core values. And um, I just believe vision is important. And I think there's something we need to understand, and this is something my, my grandma taught us. She said this, legacy is not an option. Legacy is a divine obligation. Right. And whether you've thought about it before or not, maybe this is the first time you've even thought of the word legacy for your home. Every single person that's sitting in a chair today, every single person in a car or watching online, you have a legacy. You have a legacy. There's a story written about you. Maybe you're not happy with your story. Maybe you're not proud of the choices you've made. Maybe you feel like you could have done things better. You could have been a better dad. You could have been a better mom. Maybe your marriage isn't where you want it to be. Maybe you feel like coronavirus has made things 10 times worse and now you just don't know if your family can make it. Can I tell you some good news today? Your story's not over. Your story's not over. Your legacy isn't decided on your deathbed. Your legacy is decided daily. And today, you can write a new story. You can change the direction of your story. Your family can have a different outcome. Some of you need to hear that today. Your family can have a different outcome. It doesn't have to be what you think it's going to be. You can make a difference for your family. You can change the narrative 
of your life, but all it takes is surrendering to God and saying, God, I need you to lead me. God, I need you to lead my family. Lord, I need you to direct my life. Your legacy isn't over. Your story isn't over. There's still so much more to be written. There's still so much more that can be said about your life. No matter how old you are, you still have an opportunity to make a difference, to change the legacy. I'm going to have everyone in here close your eyes. All those watching online, you can close your eyes as well. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to present an opportunity to those today who feel like they feel like their, their legacy is ruined. They feel like they've made bad decisions and they want to change the course of their life. The only way you can truly change your legacy for it to, your story to be written the right way is to put your foundation and your hope in Jesus. You see, Jesus tells a story in the Bible. He says that there was a man who built his house and he, he built it on sand. And when the storms came, and when, when the trials came, the, the house blew over because it wasn't built on the right foundation. But then there was another man who built his foundation on rock. And when winds came and when trials came and when storms came, he was able to withstand the plans of the enemy, the plans that were coming against him because he was building his foundation the right way. You see that rock, that right foundation is Jesus Christ. He's why we're here today. And today, I want to provide you an opportunity to receive Jesus, to put your faith in Him, to change the course of your story, to write a new legacy of somebody who's on fire, somebody who's passionate about Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't know if you can sense it, but the presence of God is in this place. I want everyone just to take a moment and reach out your hands. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here, God. We surrender ourselves to you, Jesus. Lord, show us the things that need to change, God. Show us the things that need to be different. Lord, there's so many things going on in our lives right now, God, in society and the world and politics and God, all around the world, Lord, we need your presence, God, and we need you to step in and help us, Lord. Jesus, we welcome you at this moment. On the count of three, you can put your hands down, those that, that lifted your hands and join with that. On the count of three, I'm going to have you raise your hand. If you want to accept Jesus, you want to put your faith in Christ. After I say three, you're going to lift your hand. And what you're saying is, God, I believe in you. I want to put my trust in you today. On the count of three. Ready? Here we go. One, two. If you want to put your faith in Jesus, when I say three, I want you to lift your hand. Three, would you lift your hand today? Thank you. Thank you all for raising your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. You guys are going to repeat this prayer after me, and we're going to do it all together as a church today so we don't single those out who just raised their hand. But the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and if you believe in your heart, you will be saved. So today, just repeat this after me, and you will be saved. Here we go. Somebody say, Jesus, I put my faith in you. Starting today, I may not understand it all, but I choose to follow you. Forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Can we give it up for those that raised their hand today? So many raised your hand and we're so thankful that you did that. That's the best decision you could have ever made. And uh, right now, this time in the service, we're going to go ahead and worship God with our giving. It's the time of the service where we get to say thank you and we get to return the 10% back to God. On behalf of Higher Vision Church, I want to say thank you. Thank you for partnering with us and trusting us with your financing, trusting God with your finances today. There's so many different ways that you can give. You can give through online. You can give through the app. You can give by writing down your credit card information on an envelope or putting your cash in an envelope um, and, and texting this number on the screen. There's so many different ways. The ushers are going to walk around with some 
envelopes right now if you need those. Go ahead and raise your hand and they'll get that to you. But we're going to take a moment and we're going to worship after I pray over you. And then Pastor Eilani is going to come back up and pray over your family. But come on, let's get ready to worship Jesus. Let's get ready to press in. I believe with all my heart that God is about to bring restoration in your family. That God's about to bring change in your, your circumstance. Your family's not too far gone. Your situation isn't over. So I'm going to take a moment and pray over you right now. Come on. Would you reach out your hands? Father, I pray over this congregation. God, would you bless them today? God, would you turn them around? God, would you bless these finances as we trust you? God, would your hand be on their family, Lord? And we commit ourselves today to trust you, to put our faith in you. God, restore to us the joy of our salvation as we begin to worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet together as we worship God. We honor you today. Come on, let's sing this together. as we pray a prayer of blessing over you and your family. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you into the homes represented in this place and online today. We welcome you into our families. God, in every broken peace, in every broken relationship, would you release your healing power? God, would you restore broken relationships right now in the mighty name of Jesus? God, wayward children, separated marriages. God, we call them back together in the name of Jesus. Your word says that where there is unity, you command a blessing. So we declare unity amongst families today. We thank you for your resurrection power. God, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. So would you resurrect relationships that look hopeless today? We speak hope into situations where it is so dry, God, but we fix our eyes on you today and we say you are greater still, that our best days are before us and not behind us. God, that we are ahead and not beneath. We thank you, Jesus, for the power you have given us as your sons and daughters to rewrite our legacy and make sure that we are God-honoring people. May Higher Vision Church be a place that beckons welcome home to the orphan, welcome home to, to the, the families, God, that are lonely and that need help in this season. Would we be that lighthouse and that home for them. We pray all of this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, if you guys made that decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, go to discoverhv.com. We'd love for you to fill out the connect card so we can help you on some next steps with that journey. But otherwise, we're praying for you. We're thankful for you. We can't wait to see you next weekend here at Higher Vision Church. Have a great week, everyone.